of the Lord. Today we begin, well, we're on week two of the message series that we've called What Will It Cost? And something's happened and it won't come up on, there it is. Last week we heard how Jesus was challenging those who were accompanying him on the road to Jerusalem to face an uncomfortable reality. He told them, if anyone comes to me without hating father, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, and their own life too. They cannot be my disciple. And then he added another challenge. He said to them, anyone who does not carry his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. This is a theme that's been running through these last few weeks where Jesus is reminding the people that they cannot afford to be an observer, a theatre goer, watching what's going on. If we're to be a disciple, a Christ follower, it means we have to be in the midst of what is happening. And it's a good point just for a moment to think about what was the context of history at the time that Luke was writing this gospel. It's about the year 70. The temple in Jerusalem has been destroyed and the people have been subjected to incredible persecution and torture. So when they're talking about carrying their cross... They're not just recognising that Jesus carried the cross to his suffering and his death, but then through the glory of the resurrection was restored to us. But here, these people are thinking of their own family and friends, people whom they knew who have also been subjected to the cross, the persecutions that followed the death of Jesus. So when he's talking about carrying the cross... He's not talking about something that we might think is a sickness or an illness for us to bear. The people were hearing that this was what could happen if they were arrested for being a Christ follower. So if you were a member of a family and part of your family wasn't really supportive or encouraging of you being a Christ follower, then they could report you and you could be arrested and you would be crucified. So Jesus' words, unless you're prepared to give up your life and carry my cross, then you cannot be my disciple. They're not idle words. They are words that impact incredibly on the life of every single person who is there. And so Jesus' words here are really, really challenging. They're putting right into the midst of what's happening the reality that so many people were actually experiencing we know that the support of those around us is important. And if we find that we're not getting that support, if we're not being encouraged in our faith, then things can go very badly wrong. And we hear a situation like that in our first reading from the book of Exodus today. Moses has been called to the mountaintop to receive from the Lord the Ten Commandments, the law of the people of God, to renew the covenant that God had created for his people. The people are down in the valley, and like everyone who's sitting around waiting, there's a sense of impatience. What's happening? Why are we here? We've all heard kids saying, why are we waiting? Why are we here? What's it about? And the people were like that. And so they went to Aaron, and Aaron foolishly accepted I've got to do something to keep them quiet. I've got to keep, do something to keep them under control. And so he asked for them to bring their jewellery, their gold, and he made for them a molten calf. He wanted to stop them complaining against God and in fact did exactly the opposite to what God really wanted. And so we hear God say to Moses, Leave me now. My wrath shall blaze out against them and devour them. But even in the midst of God's anger, there is still hope for the people because God says to Moses of you however I will make a great nation now a few weeks ago we heard Abraham with his audacious prayer trying to save the people of Sodom if I can find just 10 good men will you save the people and God said yes so Moses in a similar kind of vein looks to God and says Lord should why should your wrath blaze out against this people of yours whom you brought out of the land of Egypt 
Remember Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. So Moses pleads with God, please don't do this to your people. Give them another chance. And we know that as God relented with Abraham, he says to Moses, God relented and did not bring, out, bring on his people the disaster he had threatened. If we were to read just the Old Testament, we would have an image of God who, for the most part, is a vengeful God, a judging God. There are some books in the Old Testament, the book of Hosea is one of them, where God is shown to be a merciful God. But fairly frequently that we speak and hear about how God punishes his people for their uh, iniquities, their sinfulness. And so there is a sense that it's only when we start to read the gospel passages and the letters of the New Testament that we see an image of God which is not a judging God, but rather a merciful God. And that becomes very clear in the letter of Paul to Timothy, our second reading today, where Paul says very beautifully, Mercy was shown me, because until I became a believer, I had acted in ignorance. And the grace of the Lord filled me with faith and with the love that is in Christ Jesus. Paul recognises that it's not a punishing God who rules the, the earth, but a God that we've been introduced to through the life, death and resurrection of Jesus, a merciful God, a God of love and kindness. Because Paul then goes on to say, one, makes, tell us one of the great truths of the New Testament when he says, here is a saying that you can rely on and nobody can doubt. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. Not to destroy, but to save. And that brings us, of course, to the beautiful readings of uh, Luke chapter 15, the Gospel of today. But before I read anything about that, I'd like to just uh, start with some comments from Sister Mary McGlone, an American scripture scholar and writer. I read this and I thought, this is just a, a slightly different um, take on what the readings are about. And she has a, a different way of expressing it. She says, today's scene opens with some goody two-shoes complaining that Jesus ate with unworthy people. It probably wouldn't have bothered them that much had they not also eaten with Jesus. You see, in their religious culture, eating with something, someone was kind of a spiritual union. Thus, if one night Jesus ate with the local clergy and the next night with the riffraff, then the two were the same. Now, both crowds might have, in fact, taken that as an insult, but it was the religious types who became vocal about it. So in reply, she says, Jesus prepped the crowd for one of his most famous stories with a couple of outlandish prequels. First, he suggested that a shepherd might leave 99 sheep to wander off the nearest cliff while he went chasing for the one that had wandered off from the flock. And then he tells the story of a woman so distraught about losing one coin that she wore down her broom, used an oil, all the oil in her lamp to search for it, and then threw a party that surely cost more than the lost and found drachma. With the audience warmed up for the clincher, Jesus opens with the line, a man had two sons. We've seen before that Jesus has a sense of humour and he has a sense of irony that when he speaks into people's lives, he's really asking them, think about this. Just think about what I'm telling you and recognise that I'm having a go at you that I'm challenging you to think differently from the way you've always thought. So then we have this beautiful story, the story we call frequently the prodigal son, but it could be called the lost son, or it could be the unforgiving son, or it could be the prodigal father. It doesn't matter what name you use or whatever you think of the story. The image of the forgiving father is an incredibly powerful image. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time looking at all the different parts of the story. I'd just like to focus on one aspect. And that's the image of the father waiting for his son, hoping that he might come back. The parable tells us, while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was moved with pity. He ran to the boy, 
clasped him in his arms, and kissed him tenderly. This image of the father waiting reminds me of a story that I was told when I was in Ireland in 2001. It was the story of Mary Robinson, the Irish pre president who, who was in charge from 1990 to 1997. In Dublin, the Viceregal Lodge is in a huge park called Phoenix Park and it's part of the road that takes you out of Dublin towards the north. She put a lamp in an upstairs window as a symbol, lighting the way for the Irish immigrants and the emigrants and their descendants, welcoming them home to Ireland. Now remember back in the 70s and 80s, a lot of the young people left Ireland looking for some kind of hope somewhere else. But then in the uh, IT boom of the late 80s and early 90s, Ireland became what they called the tiger uh, economy and people came back. But this lamp was saying to them that they were welcomed and that they were wanted. That image of hope, a static light in the story of the Irish president, but the running father in the story of the gospel speaks so powerfully about what God's love really is about. Because what the Father did was totally and completely out of character. No one would have thought that the Father running down the road, chasing this son who would have still been, just think about it, in the clothes he'd worn in the pigsty, and his father, dressed in his normal garments, runs down the road and embraces him. There is no decorum at all in this action. It is total and complete love. And so Jesus tells this story, and the scribes and the Pharisees would have been beside themselves with anger that Jesus could tell a story about a man so diminishing himself in the eyes of others that he was a laughingstock. And they would have thought, what is this man talking about? And yet what Jesus was saying was that the love of God is like that. It's not something which is tied up, but it is so full of em embracing love that it is capable of reaching out without respect, without kind of concern for what others think, to embrace the lost son. The far these parables where Jesus is telling these three stories is saying to the tax collectors, the sinners, the Pharisees, and the scribes, telling them about a God, an image of God that is so totally different from what their old law had told them about a vengeful, judging God. He's saying to the people that God wants us to be his sons and daughters and that we're all invited to become part of the kingdom of God, no matter where we are at the moment. It is that coming back to God and to be embraced in his love, which speaks about the kingdom. But that's the real kicker. We have to come back, and we have to start the journey to walk into the presence of God. Sadly, the Gospels tell us the scribes and the Pharisees were more concerned about the rigid letter of the law. Jesus is saying it's the love of God which is the most important. Now, as I've said on previous occasions, the rejoinder, don't go and break the law. What it means is that if we do break the law, then God's forgiveness and God's love is embracing and welcoming us back. The story of the gospel has us with walking with Jesus as he comes closer and closer to Jerusalem. And he's going to keep challenging his listeners and his followers to know that the love of God and embraces each and every person equally. There is no distinction. God embraces each one of us as we are. And he wants us to love others in the same way, to be open to their needs and to respect who they are so that together we may come into the kingdom of our God and know the fullness of his love and mercy.